at that point know if I was alive or dead. This was just the start of a very harrowing experience. I had this horrible sense of somebody following me. All of a sudden, I could hear a faint baby cry. It was like being in a nightmare, but I was fully awake. He said it, that something was coming for me. If you had asked me before, ghosts don't exist, what are you talking about? Whatever it was wanted me to be afraid. I didn't want to believe that I had seen a ghost. But this was a life-changing experience for me. In one of the city's largest hospitals, nursing assistant Marlon Brandon is starting his shift. I work on the neurology intensive care unit. These are people that are in critical care for neurological reasons. It could be because they had a stroke, a traumatic brain injury, the neurological disorders that cause people to become paralyzed. These were very, very critical care patients. I get the most satisfaction from knowing that someone is better off after they've encountered me than they were before. Maybe they were hungry and they're not hungry anymore. Maybe they were cold and I gave them a blanket. So it's, it's like immediate gratification and I enjoy it so much. One day, Marlon has an encounter with a patient that will change his life. What's going on? They were wheeling uh, a young African American man in on a stretcher. It was a really big kid, like maybe a football player type. He looked confused. I could really feel his restlessness and his agitation. Relax, you gotta oh, lie down. No, I can't. I can't be here right now. <laughs> Out of here right now. Hey, brother, brother, calm down. I'm with you, all right? Because he was so young and because he was so afraid, I said, why don't I just do a one-to-one -one with him? Maybe a familiar face, somebody that kind of looks like him, kind of speaks in his own jargon, could calm him down. You're in the hospital. We're going to take good care of you. Everything's going to be OK. okay. It's going to be OK, all right? Marlon finds some time to talk to the young man. Honestly, I'm fine, man. Do you remember what happened? No. I mean, last thing I do remember, I was shooting this music video. He collapsed on the set of a music video that he was directing and choreographing. It was about police brutality. It's a real important issue, man. It's a lot of brothers dying every day. They brought him to the ER, and they determined that wherever his issue was, was neurological. If you guys don't let me go out and finish that, then it's like I'm leaving all those brothers hanging. It's like, it's like their deaths. They didn't mean anything. He said, I can't be admitted to the hospital right now. I'm in the process. I have to make this video. It's serious, mm -hmm. right? But your health's more serious. We got to know each other. We bonded in, in a way that I believe was very beneficial for him. All right, boss, see you around, eh? All right. I got to feel his energy. Hey, I'll be back in a couple hours, all right? All right. We'll talk tomorrow, OK? Cool. He had a very, very good energy. I had no idea what was coming. Soon after James arrives, Marlon learns something terrible about his condition. It's not looking good. James, we was assessed, and he had a very, very 
rare neurological disorder, and it was something they'd never seen in anybody that young. I'm sorry, Marlon. He could pass away at any moment. I was very upset. He was so young. He had his whole life ahead of him. An hour and a half into my uh, shift, I had to go from one building to the other. I had this horrible sense of somebody following me. Look back, I didn't see anybody. But the energy, it was like really, really scary. Marlin suddenly gets the feeling that he should check on James. I saw James standing outside of his room. What's going on? I'm good. Come on. I know when something's up. I'd never seen him scared, but, but he looked terrified. It feels, it feels weird in there. It was a, 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 a feeling of panic, of dread. Yeah, something didn't feel right. What are you talking about? <sighs> now, I looked behind him, and the best way to describe it was like a hooded figure. And my heart was almost palpitating. Whoa. I was absolutely terrified. The same sense of fear that I felt, James also felt, and he ran from it. The thing went up into the ceiling and disappeared. In James's room, if you look out the window, it was the roof of another building. If you had asked me before, I'd say, what are you talking about? Ghosts don't exist. What the <laughs> It was snowing, and I could see human bare footprints in the snow on the roof. Even if there was some explanation for someone else being out there, they wouldn't have been out in that deep snow in their bare foot. Even if someone said to me, oh, they were doing maintenance on the roof. All right, well, maintenance workers in the snow would have had boots on. <clears throat> there was no possible logical explanation for why I would see footprints. If you had asked me before this incident, I would have absolutely told you it's not true. I, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. It's all super sick. Ghosts don't exist. What are you talking about? But this was a life-changing um, experience for me. A few days later, on Marlin's next shift, he's anxious to check on James. I'd gone away, and when I came back to work, I went in, you know, where's my boy? The bed was all made up, and all of the monitors were disconnected. And I just remember, I, uh, I'm sorry. I just remember uh, this feeling of sadness because it's you taking care of somebody every day, and then you go and look, and there's an empty bed there, and uh, he'd passed away. He was like this full of life, energetic person that was working for this noble cause. He wanted to make this video to bring attention to police brutality. And it was just so sad to me that, you know, he passed away. 
before he could complete it. A week later, things are only getting stranger for Marlon. A man was admitted to neurology intensive care unit with Guillaume-Barre syndrome. My name is Marlon, I'm here to help you out. Manny, how you doing? He was paralyzed from the neck down. There was no movement, no sensation in his arms, legs, or anything below his mid shoulder area. Manny, you okay? It is absolutely medically and physically impossible for him to be moving. But what really made the hair on the back of my neck stand up was the fact that his feet were moving in a very, very specific rhythmic structure. I, I don't want to be in any damn music video. I said, what the are you talking about? I saw him. He was here. He was here in this room. He said there was a young African-American man. He described him to a T. I knew it was James. Tell him to leave me alone and go away. I don't know what the hell's going on. James was haunting this unit. I think if this person would have been able to finish his music video, he would have been set at peace. So much of his energy and his heart and soul was invested in this project. It's, it's not easy to walk away from something we are so invested in. Later that month, a terrible blizzard disrupts the hospital. We had what's called a code white. When the snow is so bad that nobody can leave the hospital because we need you here, because nobody else might be able to get to work. They were converting family waiting areas into makeshift places for the nurses to sleep. There wasn't any room there for me, so I went back into the unit. I remember taking a large recliner. About 20 minutes might have passed. I was sort of like in a twilight sleep. I could feel this sense of agitation again, like I had something to do. I was so terrified, I was frozen. I knew this was the kid that had died. I saw James standing in front of me. I know it was James, so I followed him. And he went into the nurse's lounge into the waiting area where the nurses were asleep. I couldn't believe it. They were dancing. I was terrified at that moment, beyond any fear that I'd ever experienced in my life. They had like this very choreographed movement and everybody was doing it at the same time. It only lasted for about 10 seconds. Marlon, why the hell are you playing that music for? We're trying to sleep. She came out and started yelling at me about waking everybody up with this music. There is no music. There's no doubt in my mind today that this kid was roaming the halls of this hospital trying to complete this music video, and somehow or another his energy or his spirit influenced the nurses to dance. That's very hard to give up, where so much of your heart and soul was going into a project that you couldn't complete. In Native American cultures, uh, when a person is, for instance, completing a, uh, a quilt or doing some beadwork, they'll employ someone from the tribe to finish their work so their spirit doesn't remain, so their spirit isn't tied to a place where they do have unfinished business. The next morning, Marlon is still blamed. Listen, Allie, I know what I've seen. The kid in the ICU, he got up and he was right here. The kid that died? 
That's what happened. I tried to explain it. I said, listen, it was this kid who needed to complete this video so much. The kid who died, he got up, he was right there. Sure he was, Marlon, sure he was. So she reported to the unit manager that the patient care assistant on duty that night came into the waiting area playing this music and w waking everybody up. I got written up for playing this music. There were four different statements from people that they were hearing this music. Everybody heard the same song, and it really, really creeped me out. Prior to this, my belief system was there was no ghost. There was nobody hanging around anywhere. Now I know that not to be true. Energy never dies. It just changes forms. And I know that there are ghosts. At some point in all of our lives, we're going to leave our body. And we may not go over to the other side. People, for whatever reason, linger around, and their spirits still hang around. And I know this to be true. Hauntings are real. Late on a summer night, Emily Walsh arrives at a hospital emergency room with excruciating abdominal pain. It was mostly in my stomach, uh, although just my whole abdominal area uh, was suffering from it. Doctors quickly determine she has an inflamed gallbladder and requires emergency surgery. It was some of the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. I've uh, definitely never had surgery before, so of course I'm gonna be scared. We're gonna get started here, Emily. They were going to put me to sleep so that I could get this procedure done. He went into my neck uh, with a needle and the tube inside of it, and instead of hitting the vein that he had hoped to, There's profuse arterial bleeding. He actually severed my carotid artery and put the tube inside that. Now all of a sudden, I could die. And it's not from my gallbladder. It's from a mistake oh that was made trying to fix my gallbladder. Prep the clotting agent. Every second it was in there, it was risking me for a stroke or becoming brain dead. I was scared the fear and not knowing if I'm going to, to live or die at that point. I didn't at that point know if I was alive or dead. Emily. I felt like I went to the other side. The bleeding stopped, it's under control. I had this kind of out of body experience. OK, good. It's under control. Yeah, she looks like she's stabilized. The only way that he could get the blood to stop flowing was to basically strangle me. You're going to be OK, Emily. Just rest now. Which was extremely traumatic, because unfortunately, uh, losing my twin sister, uh, that's how she was killed. When my sister was 21 years old, unfortunately, she was killed uh, by her ex-boyfriend. As awful and as terrifying as this experience was for me, this was just the start of a very harrowing experience. As Emily is wheeled to the recovery room, a massive storm hits the city. Well, the wind was heavy and howling. It sounded like screaming. I mean, the hospital is flickering their electricity. So the room was really dark, and a lot of the light was coming through the flashes of lightning through the window. I saw a person outside my window. He 
screamed my name. <laughs> he just kept saying, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming for you! It frightened me, and I just tried to push it off uh, because at that point, uh, that's the last thing I can deal with is is more of being afraid. I, I had my fill of being afraid for that night. was the first moment that we had that we could actually talk to one another, where I wasn't being jabbed with needles or being interrupted. So when I felt up to it, I got out of that hospital bed and I walked my way painfully and slowly uh, to the family room hoping that it would feel more like home, but it was raining really hard, thunder and lightning, lots of alarms going off. Weather's crazy. It was affecting the electricity at the hospital. It's quite the storm. Security, please report to reception. Are you chilly? The room started to get very cold very quickly. It was absolutely freezing. As we were just trying to relax and talk, there was a form standing by the bookshelf. And it was kind of like a shadow, but kind of like a person at the same time. Emily. Uh -uh. I told her, well, it's going to sound crazy, but I saw a ghost. It's not uncommon for those who find themselves literally at death's door and sometimes stepping through it and then coming back to return with enhanced sensitivities. They may see spirits, they may hear disembodied voices, they may just have a sixth sense that they didn't have before. It's as if the experience of going beyond the veil and returning unlocks some kind of special sense inside the human mind. And once those blinders come off, they never go back on again. He said it's coming for you, that something was coming for me. Maybe I'm just losing my mind, I don't know. I could barely breathe, I was so afraid. I was completely terrified. That just creeped her out. She wanted to get the hell out of there and go back to, to the room that we were staying in. I think that I was so full of anxiety from everything that was happening that I, I was feeling pretty jumpy. Dr. The temperature started to change. There was no denying that that room was freezing. And I felt like something was watching me. standing at the end of my bed. His face looked melted, almost like it was burned. It made me sick to my stomach. I remember trying to get her to wake up, and I couldn't do it. I had been through so much. I didn't want any more. I felt like he was kind of trying to warn me, though, and that frightened me. 
and all of a sudden a nurse comes into the room Hi. and she walks over to the bed and walks right through him how are you doing dear and he was there one minute and then gone the next Everything looks all right here. And that was the last time I saw him. And what did you say to the nurse? I mean, obviously, I probably looked shocked, but I recovered and I told her that she had just surprised me because I didn't think that it was a good idea to let on that I was experiencing anything paranormal. I'll come back in a few hours, dear. Emily. Mom. He was here. When my mom finally woke up. Who was here? It was a man who was at the foot of my bed. I frantically told her what happened. Right there, he was tall. He, his face was gone, burnt off or something. Oh, Emily. It was awful, Mom. It felt so real. I felt completely overwhelmed. And I actually got up and I left the hospital for a while and I sat outside on a bench for probably an hour before I was willing to go back into the hospital. How the heck do you expect to sleep uh, when you're being woken up by dead people at night? After a sleepless night, a visitor comes to see Emily's roommate. It was a rough night. It was a really good night. I'm here to visit, visit me yeah, last night. The girl next door. A visitor came into the room for the man who was in the bed beside me. He was telling her that late in the evening that I had snuck a man into my room. As soon as he started describing what the guy was wearing, it wasn't right. There was something off about him. My mother and I looked at each other with like eyes wide, like, holy shit. I didn't know what he was doing. It was past visit hours. I mean, to have that validation um, in what I saw. Oh my God, Stanley. And the two of us, we were scared. We just kind of sat there completely dumbfounded for quite a while. They should at least get you a private room. The next night brings the return of violent storms and new horrors for Emily and her mom. I remember being afraid to look up because I felt a presence in the room. You could hear this awful sucking, grinding noises. <laughs> there was this creature and it was perched on her chest. It was the scariest thing I have ever seen in my life. Get off of her! It was almost like it was sucking the energy out of her. It looks like the paranormal equivalent of some kind of leech. Emily's mother is deeply bereaved over the death of one of her daughters. And grief is a very powerful and potent emotion. Just the sort of thing that some kind of vampiric entity would latch onto and feed on. Get the hell away from her! It turned to me and looked at me. All that energy directed on me, and I felt such intense fear. Get off of her! I just don't think I've ever been so afraid in my life. told me, you're not okay. You've not been okay from the beginning. <laughs> you didn't make it through the first surgery. 
you died when they cut your neck. Everything that happened up until this point is just a response of your brain turning off and shutting down. These are the last hallucinations of a dying girl. I didn't know if I was alive fighting this or if I had died back when the anesthesiologist made the cut that changed my life. That was probably one of the scariest things in my life, uh, right up there with when I lost my sister. There is no word that would describe the fear and the hopelessness. And to feel like I was going to fall into nothing and become nothing and that I was dead. Whatever it was wanted me to be afraid. It wanted me to feel isolated and it wanted me to give up hope and maybe my life. I think that it fed off that kind of thing. <laughs> I started to pray for my sister. Please come to me. Sister, please come to me. Sister, please. Sister, please, if you can hear me, please help me. I'm so scared. Please help me. Please hear me. Please help me. And all of a sudden, I could hear singing. Lights started to shine through the blinds of the windows. The most beautiful singing voice that I could imagine, and it just filled me full of strength and hope. I do believe that I had an angel on my side that night, uh, and I do think that my sister had something to do with it. Emily? Mom? Which I'm grateful for. Are you okay? Yes. And I just feel like she would protect me more than anyone. You okay, Emily? The following morning, Emily is released from the hospital. Her nightmare finally over. I've thought about life and death differently since I've lost my sister. So I do feel like this experience has opened my eyes even more. Because I always thought about, you know, my sister died and now she's in a better place. Um, but I didn't really give much thought to the opposite of that to the possibility that there could be demonic things or some kind of version of hell. Get the hell away from her! Whether or not I believe in an actual hell, I think that whatever field of existence that it was from is not a pleasant place at all, and uh, I'm going to try my best to avoid experiencing that again. It's 2012 in Toronto, Ontario. It was a Wednesday in October, five months pregnant, and I decided to do my daily routine, which was go for a walk. It was always so soothing, so calming. And because no one ever bothered me when I went for my walks, I always go along the same path. But the area has a dark and tragic past. We were hit back in the 1950s by Hurricane Hazel, and many families perished. 
But I like to walk along that path because there are memoriams. I believe that a lot of the experiences lead up to something happening as a warning sign or as just something to say, hey, this is coming your way. And as I was walking, I'm just listening to the birds tweet. I'm feeling the breeze on my face. It just, it was a beautiful day. And all of a sudden, I could hear a faint baby cry. It wasn't necessarily the cry of hunger or I need to be changed. It sounded like a baby almost panicking. I was a deer in headlights. I wanted to know where the sound was coming from, but it sounded like it was coming from everywhere. I was completely immobilized. I couldn't move. And it terrified me at the same time. When I was just frozen. My heart started to race. It was like being in a nightmare, but I was fully awake. I was there. I was present. My first instinct, of course, is to put my hands on my belly and just make sure that baby's OK. But baby was still kicking. I was so afraid. And I remember walking. I felt disoriented. I felt so confused, but almost stunned. My heart raced. Adding to Stephanie's confusion is a growing sense of unease. Feeling sick, she stumbles home. Chris! Hey. And my husband looked at me and he says, you look you okay? very, very pale. You look like you've seen a ghost. I, I don't feel good. I felt faint. I needed to lay down. I couldn't calm down my heartbeat at all. He goes, we're calling 911. You're going to the hospital. 911, what's your emergency? Stephanie is rushed to the hospital with dangerously low blood pressure. The baby's life would have been at risk without medical attention. They hooked me up to IVs, and they kept me overnight for observation. The night nurse checked my vitals. I'll be back in a little bit, OK? OK, thank you. I had convinced him, let's go for a walk, just because I need to. His whole thing was, you know, let's go back to the room so you can rest. Hun, why don't you just go call my parents? You sure? Yeah, I'm I'm just going to keep walking. So I told them I'll meet you back at our room. OK, I'll talk to you later. OK, bye. All of a sudden, I heard the same baby cry again. It sounded panicked. My heart started to race again. I did feel immobilized for a brief second. Something like an instinct was telling me, you need to go find this child. Just the baby's cry is enough to just make you want to pick up this child and just make sure that he's OK. When I got to my room, I was so cold. And there was a pram in my hospital room. And it was one of those old, old prams that you would see from the 1940s, 1950s. And I can see this baby sleeping in all blue. <laughs> Suddenly, I felt like there was something with me. Her scream was blood curdling. And she wrapped her arms around her stomach. It's almost like she wanted to protect the baby, but she couldn't. 
It's almost like she was wearing a gown that wasn't old. Just the material looked so different. But her eyes were black underneath. And all I could do was just turn from her and look inside the pram. And then they all disappeared. <laughs> Stephanie reports that she sees the image of this mother that's screaming, baby, baby, over and over again. <laughs> baby! When we take a look at the history of this hospital, we had a hurricane where there was hundreds of victims who were trafficked through this hospital. And there was trauma that was going on. It was imprinting into the environment. My husband came back as soon as that happened. Oh my god. Are you OK? I didn't want to tell my husband so much about the detail because I felt like he would have told me, you know, your, your hormones. Stephanie is kept a second night for observation. Later on in the night, I had fallen asleep, and I had got up. And I got into the bathroom. All of a sudden, I heard the same baby cry again. The sound of that baby's cries said shivers up my body. I open the door, and I can see the pram still in place. And I can see this woman again. I'm just looking at her, and she's screaming, baby. I could feel her pain, and it felt like my heart was just shattered. It felt like she lost her baby. She was in anguish. When they disappeared the second time, I realized I had seen not one, but two ghosts. And I was confused, scared, and heartbroken. I couldn't breathe. I didn't want to believe that I had seen a ghost. <laughs> when I got home, I felt very different. I felt like I was almost like my, my old self. With a clean bill of health, Stephanie takes time to reflect on the history of the hospital. The hospital was four years old when the hurricane happened. I firmly believe that this woman and this, this baby are connected to the hurricane and the hospital. The woman and the baby that day were there to make sure that I was OK. I was lured to the hospital so that I can get medical attention for myself and for my unborn child. This experience has taught me that there is life after death. And either a spirit or a ghost can teach us something. Either we're going to run away from it. It'll stop us dead in our tracks for us to pay attention, or it'll tell us to move forward. And I believe it taught me all three. <laughs>